My mom likes to check out estate sales for vintage stuff, and lately she's built up a decent collection of old cookbooks from the 60s and 70s. These books are like a time capsule into the state of cooking and dining at the time. We started to notice some pretty wild recipes in these things and thought it would be fun to try them out. Then we thought, why not film our attempts and put it on YouTube? My mom has years of experience in the kitchen, but I probably spend more time watching cooking videos than actually cooking, so she's definitely the expert here. She also has some great mom aprons that I'm gonna borrow until I can get my own. So today we're gonna be cooking a recipe from a 1971 cookbook, New Lessons in Gourmet Cooking by Libby Hillman. This book is filled with retro recipes that were once considered fine dining. Now, if the cover isn't 1970s enough for you, they even compare rolling a crepe to rolling a cigarette. In all fairness, Libby poured her heart and soul into this book, although even she admits its recipes are perfect for those planning unusual parties. And that's probably an understatement because today we're making the five-step holiday hors d'oeuvres tray, and this thing's insane. The main dish is a lobster aspic, which is a savory lobster jello. Surrounding the jello in 1970s fashion are homemade deviled eggs, onion cucumber relish, and about a million garnishes, including two pounds of shrimp, lobster shells, melons, anchovies, and even caviar. So let's get started. We're gonna begin by steaming four lobster tails. I put about two inches of water in there and then just set the burner to high. We used three to four ounce tails, which called for steaming for about four to six minutes, but I just pulled them once they turned fully bright and started popping out the sides. An easy way to get the meat out is to take a pair of scissors and cut along the sides of the bottom of the tail. I saw this method online and it works pretty good. It also keeps the tops of the tails nice so we can use them as garnishes later on. Once you've got the back cut, you can just lift them up and scoop the meat out with a spoon. By the end, the house smelled like fish and I was starting to feel more like a surgeon than a cook, but the meat actually tasted good and we almost decided to just heat up some butter and call it a day. Next, we're going to make the jello mix that will hold the lobster. We'll start by mixing a packet of unflavored gelatin in a quarter cup of water using a heat safe cup. Just pour it in and mix for about a minute as best you can. While it's sitting, we're going to heat up a pan with about an inch of water. Once that's simmering, place the gelatin in the pan until it heats up enough to fully dissolve. I think they call this blooming the gelatin. Once it's dissolved, cut the heat and let it sit in there while we make the lobster mix. In a bowl, combine everything you've always wished was in jello, which of course includes three quarters cup mayo, a quarter cup of sour cream, two tablespoons lemon juice, a tablespoon of tarragon vinegar, a tablespoon of chili sauce, and they mean that Heinz stuff from the 60s that tastes like cocktail sauce, a tablespoon of capers, 10 sliced olives, a few pinches of white pepper, a half teaspoon of salt, and a quarter teaspoon of celery seed. Before we added the lobster, we thought, you know what's missing? Some red 40. So we brushed the lobster with some food coloring to make sure it really shines through the other ingredients. Once you've got the lobster in there, go ahead and add in the gelatin if it's not too hot. Mix until combined and then pour everything into a loaf pan or whatever mold you have in your kitchen. Cover it and put it in the fridge for at least three hours to set. While that's getting cold, we can start the deviled eggs. Hard boil a dozen eggs for about eight to 10 minutes and peel once cool. We discovered that my mom peels hard boiled eggs by cracking them and blowing into the top. Does anyone else use this method? We thought it was pretty strange. Once you got them peeled, cut them in half lengthwise, then grab a spoon and scoop out all the yolks into a bowl. Once you got all the yolks out, smash them with the fork until they're mashed up pretty good. To make the filling for the eggs, mix in a quarter cup of mayo, three ounces of cream cheese, a quarter teaspoon of pepper, a quarter teaspoon of curry powder. We just used paprika because that's all we had. A quarter teaspoon of powdered mustard, a pinch of salt, and a half teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce. Combine everything together, mix for a minute or two until it's smooth and there's no lumps. Now for some other sun bonding. Also, my mom cut her finger, that's why she's wearing gloves. Grab a spoon and scoop the yolk mix into the eggs until they look like deviled eggs you've eaten in the past. If your eggs look messy after taking the yolks out, you can rinse them in some cold water and lay them out to dry for a bit while you make your yolk mix. Now, this was the first time either of us have ever made deviled eggs, 
but I could have sworn my mom has made them in the past because I remember eating them as a child, but she says that never happened. Look at the peaks on those boys. Once the eggs are covered and in the fridge, we can make the cucumber and onion relish. We'll start by slicing a large red onion. Our knife skills are pretty bad and the knife was dull, so we decided to just use a mandolin. By this point, we were squinting pretty hard trying to finish this thing. The recipe calls for two cucumbers, but I don't think they predicted how big cucumbers would be in the future, so we went with one. Also, she says to score the sides of the cucumber with a fork before slicing. I'm not sure if that's to look fancy or to help it soak up vinegar, but I'm pretty sure I did it wrong. Once everything is sliced up, mix in a teaspoon of salt and let sit for about 40 minutes to draw out some of the water. The final step is basically a quick pickle of the veggies. Add in two tablespoons vinegar, four tablespoons water, and a teaspoon of sugar. Mix and then let sit in the fridge. Like most pickles, the longer they sit, the better they get. So you could make this dish first if you want them sour all the way through. Now that the three main dishes are finished, we can prepare some of the garnishes that will be added to the plate. The recipe calls for one large cantaloupe cut into wedges, one honeydew cut into wedges. If you can't get your hands on some melons, she recommends substituting segments of two pink and two white grapefruits, one large avocado, one bunch of parsley, some chives, and two pounds of coat shrimp. We got lazy and just bought cocktail shrimp from a package, but I stand by this decision because there's no mess and look how nice they look. Also, who cooks two pounds of shrimp as a garnish? Find the biggest tray you can in your house. This was the largest we had and it still wasn't big enough. Here's what the aspic should look like after setting. I was bummed at how small the aspic was and thought it should sit higher around the other food on the plate. So we wrapped a broken cutting board in some foil and used it as a booster seat. Now, if you're not familiar with aspics, this is the scariest part because you're not 100% sure if it's solid all the way through. And when it's not and you flip it, it all falls out and the whole thing is ruined. After all this effort, we both would have cried if it fell apart. Yay! It landed perfectly on the board with no room to spare on the front or the back. We've been cooking for hours, so we're definitely relieved. At first, we followed her suggestions for decorating the plate as best we could. We put parsley down under the aspic to fill some of the empty space. Then we started lining the sides of the aspic with shrimp. I basically just followed this pattern around all sides and put more parsley down where it looked like it should go. Now, I planned to have my mom decorate half of this thing, but she saw I was in the zone and decided to just let me cook. The next step is to line up the eggs on either side of the aspic, and now I'm starting to realize there's no way all this food is going to fit. Her next suggestion is to garnish the eggs with anchovies. Maybe she thought this dish didn't have enough seafood. She does recommend they go on every other egg, as she finds that some people do not care for anchovy. Something about parentheses around this quote makes me think that she's surprised by that fact. I love the detail in this next step. Starting from bottom to top, one inch from left, place six rolled anchovies one inch apart onto aspic. Cut six chives two inches long. Place chive under anchovy to resemble a stem. Cut six chives one half inch long. Place these onto main stem to resemble a branch. With a tiny spoon, place a few grains of caviar onto outer stem. I wasn't exactly Michelangelo in art class, and we were so beat by the end of this thing that this is what we ended up with on top of the aspic. Also, we didn't get the caviar. Not because I forgot it, but because it was like $100 an ounce at the store I went to. The tray was full at this point, so we put the melon on a separate board and stuffed the relish wherever it would fit and just put the rest in bowls on each side. Maybe I am Michelangelo because putting the lobster tails on top was a pretty nice touch in my opinion. We both worked really hard on this thing so I had to make sure my mom got some credit for the celebration shot. I also couldn't let her go sneaking off before the taste test. The tray smelled like fish, eggs, and melon which was not a combination either of us have experienced. Cutting the loaf with a knife felt like cutting jello except it was less bouncy and more lumpy. 
I realized I should have diced the lobster better because look at that giant piece that I got. It tasted exactly how you would imagine lobster jello to taste. It was fishy from the lobster, sour from the vinegar, and way too salty, which was probably from the olives. Everything's very salty. I really should have chopped up the lobster better because the big stringy pieces were pretty nasty. It almost reminded me of those old Halloween games where you close your eyes and have to guess what you're eating or feeling. If you're throwing one of those parties, you should definitely cook this dish. My mom was starving and I think she actually enjoyed it. It's not as gross as I thought it was gonna be. The relish was good, which makes sense because we both like pickles and onions and it was crunchy, which was a nice contrast to the jello. The deviled eggs were too salty, but reminded me of the ones I had at Thanksgiving as a child. So it was pretty nostalgic. Although we're still not sure who cooked those when I was a kid. My brother was laughing behind the camera, so I made him come around and try some of the jello himself. I also made him put on one of my mom's aprons. Look at mom going in for seconds. It's different. He agreed, too salty, fishy, and just not what jello should be. My mom grew up eating Italian food, so seafood and vinegar are what she's used to. Still, we were surprised at how much she liked it. We gotta get all the flavors together. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah, go ahead. That. Uh -huh. That. Oh, okay. That's a lot of <laughs> onion. Here we go. Overall, we agreed that it wasn't that bad, but definitely not worth the effort. It's a lot of work, and if you have cats, you're probably gonna need to lock them up because the whole thing smells like a giant cat treat. In all fairness, there's a lot of variety in the dish. Apparently, it feeds 18 people. And unless you're a picky eater, there's something here almost everyone can enjoy. After cooking and filming for almost 12 hours, it's time to shower off the smell of lobster and call it a night. Now, we don't want to waste the food that we cook on this channel, so we did our best to eat as much as we could. The relish got put in the fridge and the eggs and melons were eaten within a couple days. I assumed the lobster jello was a lost cause, but then I got this text from my mom the night after. She says it pairs well with Chardonnay.